Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about technology and health and how instant access to information is leading to new possibilities in managing your health. Later in the show, I'll be talking with Bruce Cohen, CEO of a company called Vitapath Genetics and an active member of the Personalized Medicine Coalition. We'll also show footage from the recent Health 2.0 conference in San Francisco where numerous companies were displaying their latest products. But now I'd like to introduce my first guest, John D'Souza. He is president and CEO of MedHelp, which is the world's largest online health community with more than 12 million unique visitors per month. John is an entrepreneur who's helped found several successful internet startups, including Flash Communications and Smartleaf, he was also part of a private equity group at Goldman Sachs that invested in healthcare and technology. And he's also a scientific researcher who's worked on guidance systems for robotic surgery at IBM, virtual reality systems for NASA's NeuroLab space project, and tools for laparoscopic surgery at the University of Tokyo. He has a master's degree in electrical engineering from MIT and an MBA from the Collège des Ingenieurs in France. And I hope I pronounced that last college correctly. That was perfect. <laughs> Great. So, so tell me, what exactly does MedHelp do? What does it offer to its users? Well, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, you know, at MedHelp, we saw three significant trends in the healthcare industry that we were going after. The first one was the fact that as individuals, we tend to live longer, and we're also having a lot more chronic conditions. So we need a lot more healthcare. At the same time, when you look at the hospitals and this is all the healthcare providers, they, they're not able to provide us with the level of care we need. There are a lot more people entering the system, and so on an individual basis, we get less healthcare. That combined with the fact that all this costs a lot more led to, uh, led to what we call the consumer health revolution. You need more healthcare, you get less of it, and it's going to cost you more. So in order to do this, we looked at a lot of sites out there, and there are a lot of sites that provide you with generic health information. What is asthma? What's cancer? We want to provide you with health information that is personalized to you, and we do it in three different ways. The first is to connect you with other people through communities. The second is to connect you with the best doctors and, and hospitals out there uh, through our uh, patient doctor forums. And the third is to give you all the tools and trackers you need to track and manage your health. Now, what kind of people use your service? You have 12 million people a month. Is there a particular demographic profile of a, a user? You know, because it is health-related, we tend to, to skew slightly older. The average age is probably around 40. But we found is probably over the last few years, uh, initially we started off being a lot more chronic conditions. But over the last few years, there's been a great interest in, in health. How do I stay healthy? So when you look at our site right now, you have a full population of people that are interested in, in, in staying healthy uh, and maintaining the health of, and keeping away all these conditions, and then people who have conditions that are dealing with those. So how do people start with this uh, med help? Do they just go to your website and create an account and just do whatever they want on the site, use whatever features they want? Yeah, the site, the site is free to users. People come in usually because they have a health question that they want to go through and, and learn about. They come to a site, uh, you can go through and, and peruse the site without logging on, but if you want to participate in it, you need to create an account and creating an account is free. So people come on, they have a question, they start reading it, and then they go through as they, d as they learn more about the condition and want to ask doctors questions, participate in health chats, or use the tools and trackers that we provide to help maintain their health. So you have actual doctors that are part of this community also? Yeah, that's actually yeah. A, a very a, a good point to bring up because for us in health, we believe that doctors are an integral part of it. And we keep on joking, you, you know, if you're flying a plane, you want a pilot on it. <laughs> and with health, you want to have doctors. And so we have relationships with many of the best hospitals, Johns Hopkins, Cleveland Clinic, Mass General. In, so when you ask questions, you ask a heart question, you can get a response from the number one heart hospital in the country, Cleveland Clinic. Now, do people actually rely on this for real medical advice? Because the doctor can't see you. All he's doing is maybe reading a message that you've sent. You know, so we're not trying to diagnose it. There's a lot of very relevant health information you can give a user. For example, a woman came on our site and her eye was hurting. It was late at night and she posted about it and she found out that she should go into the ER very soon because sometimes it, it's caused by pressure buildup in the eye that could cause uh, your optic nerve to die and lead you to get blind. She went in, that's exactly what she had. So getting that information helps you in, the, in sort of getting the right diagnosing and the right treatment you need. So it's sort of an additional tool. It doesn't replace your traditional medical care but it's another way of uh, accessing information and maybe getting a little bit of an edge? Exactly. And we're not trying to replace the doctor. We want to improve 
uh, you getting to the right doctor and have you, uh, make sure you have a better conversation with the doctor when you go and see the doctor. Now, in order to illustrate what MedHelp is about, you brought along some slides, and we're going to show those slides, and, and maybe you can explain what they're about. So can we see that first slide, please? Okay, so there it is. We're looking at uh, this slide right here. So this cross-platform solutions, what is that telling us? So the burden of actually taking care of your health has been moved over to the individual. You need to get a lot more involved. And there are a lot of things that people use to, to take control of the health. They use their cell phone. There are a lot of devices uh, that they use to track their movement or what they eat. Uh, but when we looked at this, in the end, you need all this to integrate together to give you a perspective about a condition. I have diabetes, and what does that mean to me? So we actually went through and, and we sort of built a system that allows you to do exactly that, is to be able to take the, the data that you enter from your cell phone, from a device, and then view it. Uh, wherever you are. If you're in a doctor's hospital, how do I show that information to my doctor? If I feel a symptom, how, if I feel an arrhythmia, how do I enter it where I am? So we so solve three things with it is enter whatever you want, wherever you are, whenever it happens. So you're owning your own health information and you carry it around with you, sounds like. Exactly. We believe very strongly that it is your health information. You, you need access to it whenever it is important to you and that's how you get better health. Okay, and now we have another slide. Let's take a look at the next slide, please. Okay, so that looks like three uh, cellular phones with <laughs> pictures on them, something to do with pregnancy. What's that telling us? Is the, the, the one device that we think has revolutionized uh, uh, consumer healthcare is the cell phone. It's a device that you have with you all the time and can use it uh, to enter symptoms or show information to your doctor. Over here, we have one of the applications that we built, which is a pregnancy application called I'm Expecting that's available on iPhone and Android. All of the applications are built with two things in mind. It needs to be engaging for the user. Here, the users can do a lot of to learn a lot of information, but they can do fun things like take a full baby bump gallery. But it also needs to be medically relevant to the doctor. So we have a full suite of these applications, and on the back end, they're all integrated. So if somebody was using our ovulation tracker and then got pregnant, all the data would go from that into your pregnancy. After that, if you have a child, all the data uh, continues to follow on. And so there's a full suite that's actually connected on the back end. Now with these tracker programs where it monitors your progress, do you have to enter the data manually every day? I'm, I'm thinking that maybe that would deter some people if they had to spend the time to enter a lot of data. So there are two things. One is, you're right, it, it, there are some conditions where people will go through and enter data every day. But if people actually use a device and they use a withing scale or something that they step on, we can pull in that data. So if you use a device, we'll pull it in. But we've also realized that you don't need to enter the data every day. There's a lot of value in entering the data periodically because getting the snapshot of somebody's health over time gives you that longitudinal data that's very important. Okay, let's go to the next slide now. Okay, so here's a slide that uh, pregnancy symptoms and there are three colored graphs on it. What, what's that telling us? The number one question on our site is, am I normal? People have a desire, no matter what they have, if I have a rash on my hand, is it normal? Should I be concerned about it? And so as people go through and enter the data, we help people answer that question is, how does your, uh, what you're feeling compare with other people who are similar to you? Over here, we have a graph that shows you the pregnancy symptoms, three of them, for every week of pregnancy. So that if you're in the 20th week of your pregnancy and you have back pain, uh, you can say, is it normal? And what should I expect? What's going to happen? We can also start answering questions like, if you look at women in, uh, in, in San Francisco between the age of 35 and 37, how, what are their symptoms and how do they differ from people, women of, that are a different age group? So your symptoms maybe won't feel so bad if you know that a lot of other people are sharing the same symptoms as well. I, exactly. You know that at least I'm not out of the norm. If you are out of the norm, let's say maybe you should go and check very quickly. Now we've got one more slide. Let's take a look at this fourth slide now. Okay, there's a map of the United States and it says average mood by state. So when, when we went through and started collecting all this personalized health information, we realized that we had this treasure and that we quickly became the largest source of patient-entered data. And we were able to take the data and aggregate it on a local level, a regional level, or a national level. Over here, what you see is we've aggregated all the mood data that we got on, on a state-by-state -state level. And you can go through and see the states where people are feeling better and where people are not feeling that good. What's interesting is that if you look at it over the last 12 months, we are actually at, as a, on a national level at a low point in terms of how people feel. With the lowest, uh, people don't feel that good. And we did some correlation data with states in which there's high unemployment, and there's a very high correlation there. So it allows you to see interesting trends that are occurring on, across the country and, and see how they vary over time. I have a lot more questions I'd love to ask you, but we have to go on to the next segment of our program, 
We recently visited the Health 2.0 conference in San Francisco, and I interviewed some of the entrepreneurs there. When we come back from that video, I'm going to speak to Bruce Cohen, who is president and CEO of a company called Vitapath Genetics. So let's go ahead and roll that tape. We recently went to the Health 2.0 conference at the Hilton Hotel in San Francisco. A series of speakers discussed the impact of new information technologies on healthcare, while in the exhibit hall, companies displayed their latest products. We spoke to the leaders of some of these companies to find out what's new in this rapidly growing field. Carl Ulfers is the Vice President of Consumer Solutions at Optum Health, which builds products that foster better online communications between healthcare consumers and healthcare providers. Now, who are your customers? Is it the healthcare consumers or healthcare providers or both? Both. So we um, sell our services to employers, to payers, to providers, and then we service their members or consumers on behalf of those uh, on behalf of those organizations. Now, let's talk about your new iPhone app, which is called Optimize Me. Yep. Um, and Optimize Me is really focused on helping consumers. Um, with their nutritional needs, with from a weight loss perspective, from an exercise perspective, from a smoking cessation standpoint. Now what are some of the benefits that I could receive from this app? So the benefits you can receive from this app as a consumer is number one, it's focused on helping you improve your health and what you're specifically focused on. So is this a multi-user situation where you're actually interacting with other Ab people who absolutely. have similar issues? Absolutely. So you actually build your community as you go through this app application, and that community key is always with you within the app, and you can just easily swipe it up with your thumb, and you can see your friends, you can see the challenges that you're in, other people that are participating with you, and then you can easily interact with them, whether it's uh, giving them a kudos, which is a, app, uh, a feature of the app, or a butt kick if it's one of your friends that hasn't been doing the work that they need to do. Would it work with my local clients? In other words, can I make an appointment with my local clinic? So this? in the application, um, you can't. However, in the online experience that goes along with this, we've integrated into our, our partnership with American Well called Now Clinic. And so what that gives you the ability to do is in seven different states now across the country, we have physicians um, lined up directly into our online platform. And within one easy click from that platform, it automatically puts me into that virtual clinic. And then within another click, I can actually be, uh, have a conversation with a physician about me or, as we see it most often, my family members' uh, needs. So what do you say is the biggest strength of your company? Is it the medical knowledge or the, the skill of the computer programmers? It's a, it's a good question. We, we like to say that we're trying to bring the intersection of the science and the medical uh, mm -hmm. science and the art of understanding the consumer together. Um, and then the underpinning of actually making that real is the technology and development that we have underneath it. And so the reason we feel we've got a differentiated value prop is that we are bringing both the mobile the online and the service experience from a coaching perspective, all together, all centered around the consumer's need. When it comes to healthcare, which is hard and confusing and complex for consumers, when they get in time of need, based off of how we've helped support them, we want them to be able to turn to us as that expert to help, help them through their needs. I also spoke to Brent Poole, CEO of a company called MindBloom, whose online product seeks to improve your mental, physical, and spiritual health. Well, MindBloom uh, has a goal of making a way for people to uh, to live healthier, happier, more more balanced lives, and uh, and we're doing that uh, through a social gaming experience. So, how does that work? Let's say that I want to play this game. What do I do? Well, uh, you would go to MindBloom.com and uh, and you'll log into the experience. And, um, and I'll show you here in a minute what essentially you would do is we ask you to start to prioritize the different areas of your life. And, uh, and with the input uh, that we get from you, then we grow a tree that represents you. And, uh, and then the game begins. The game is about growing this tree to a big and healthy tree and then keeping it healthy, growing a forest of your family and friends and keeping all of that healthy. This gives people a way to express themselves with words, music, and images. As I go back uh, into this, this here's my tree. Here's the sun and in the and the uh, in the clouds here. Sun for for this uh, environment is inspiration. And so as I click in, then there's a way for me here 
to go through and find other people's inspiration. Like we have all these really cute characters. We have a humblebee, we have a dragonfly, we have the enlightening bug, we have a, a, a scapegoat. Um, uh, these funny characters and the enlightening bug comes in and sort of leads the person through the whole and explains the the currency and how the sun and the and the, and the rain and, and all these other pieces work together. Uh, we created Mind Bloom so that our moms could use it basically and the idea was that with no technical background at all um, you would have this very natural experience and you would click in the places where you should click because they're, you're drawn to them and you would do the things that make sense to you. We do have uh, uh, incredible data about how, pe how people interact with this and how much they come back and the interactions that they have between each other and all of that essentially says, wow, we've got an engaged audience. Um, and what we're doing with that is selling uh, this engagement platform to enterprise. And with MindBloom, we, we give people the way to really focus on any or all domains of their life at the same time. And in, in some ways, the tree that you grow becomes data visualization. And it's a representation of me. It's, it's my priorities. It's my progress. And ultimately, I can see like where, I, where I'm putting my, my time and energy. Finally, I spoke to Damon Ramsey, MD, who is CEO of a company called Healthism, which offers online social networking tools aimed at preventive health maintenance. So Healthism is a, what I would say is an early, early stage startup in the health information technology sector. And our focus is on providing a very effective and powerful preventative health platform. What we essentially do is provide personalized health advice, which enhances the user experience online. And we weave that personalized health advice into a social network for health goals. One of the things that you'll notice right off the bat is that we have a huge focus on user interface. And it's partially, I think, because of my, my own experience in leading this team. Um, I know who my user is, and my user is generally a baby boomer. So I'm not designing games necessarily for them, because I know that that's not necessarily the most interesting thing. What we really focus is, uh, on is creating that user experience, which is very, very easy to use. The other thing is our focus on um, technology that you already know how to use. SMS is a big portion of healthism. Soon, phone is going to be a big portion of healthism as well. And I think it would be amazing to be able to have an automated call that comes, uh, comes through and says, did you go for your walk? And you just press one, and then that actually shoots off into your Facebook account, into your healthism account, and also shares it with your health provider. Now, some people who design technology products say that the ultimate test is that they can use it. Do you use it I yourself? use it. Now, that, that's actually an interesting point. Um, I have a very, very busy schedule. I wake up in the morning. I have 500 emails waiting for me. Um, but I make simple goals on healthism, and it's actually made a big difference. So um, one of them was to bike every day to work, um, which I made with my partner. And what we're actually doing is tracking it using the SMS platform that we've created. Now, is this a social networking tool where you're in communication with other users, yes. comparing notes with them? Yes, exactly. So what happens is it's, a, it's an interesting process from risk factor, action report, um, action item. And the action item funnels you into a group of people that also have the same issues. So if it, if it might be that we're setting a goal for walking, well, you'll join as a walking group. So do you feel that the fact that you've not only made a decision to jog a certain amount every day, but you've made that public and told this whole community of people that you're going to do that, does that make it more likely that you will actually do it? I think you're touching on the main point there. It's, it almost makes you accountable. That was our footage from the recent Health 2.0 conference in San Francisco. I'd now like to introduce my next guest, Bruce Cohen, President and CEO of VitaPath Genetics, which offers individualized DNA analysis for medical purposes. This is his third biotech startup company, and he spent over 25 years in leadership positions in the life sciences and high technology fields. He's also a member of the Personalized Medicine Coalition, which seeks to make medical treatments more uniquely tailored to the individual's genetic makeup. He also has an MBA from Harvard Business School. Bruce, what exactly does your company do? Uh, thanks for having me here, Marty. Uh, Vitapath Genetics is a uh, uh, relatively young biotech company based here in uh, Northern California that's developing a suite of tests that will help identify 
rare mutations in humans that can be overcome safely and easily. How do you find your users? Does a person feel they have a problem so they go to you? Well, our first product identifies women who have a genetic risk of having a baby with spina bifida. And spina bifida is a relatively common birth defect uh, that is debilitating. It is preventable in most cases if you know you're at risk. And right now, the only way to know you're at risk is if you've already had a baby with spina bifida. What our test is, hope we, we hope it will do is identify women genetically who carry that risk so they can take preventive measures before they get pregnant. Do you do any follow-up with it, or you just give them the results of the test and then they take it from there? Well, there's standard medical practice for a woman who has a risk of having a baby with spina bifida. And throughout the world, the medical practice is they go on very high-dose folic acid, which is a B vitamin, under the care of a physician. And the literature says that that will prevent the disease about 70% of the time. Is the test easy? Do you just need a few cells, or is it an invasive procedure? No, it's a saliva-based test, so you simply have to spit into a plastic tube and drop it in the mail. Now, I assume that over time you're not going to limit it to this one test because there are probably many tests to check for many propensities for disease. That's correct. Um, we believe that there are perhaps 100 diseases of humans that are all related to relatively rare genetic mutations that are invisible during most of your life but become biologically relevant when your body's under stress. And pregnancy is a great example of a body under stress. Now, do you figure out what the tests are? Do you figure out what you have to analyze to determine if there's a likelihood of a disease? Or is that done by somebody else and you're just performing a test that somebody else already devised? No, we develop the test ourselves. We look for the mutations in people who are affected by the disease, and then we test that uh, genetic panel on a separate cohort to make sure that the findings we have are valid and generalizable to the population. Now, you're also very much involved in something called the Personalized Medicine Coalition. What is that, and how does that relate to the work of your company? The Personalized Medicine Coalition is a Washington-based group of about 200 companies and academic institutions that are all trying to advance the case for personalized medicine, the ability to tailor therapy to an individual's specific situation, and in many cases, their genetics. Now, is that for you know, simple ailments like the common cold, or are we talking about very complicated diseases with uh, you know, maybe difficult treatments? So the most exa advanced examples of personalized medicine relate to the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. And there are a number of therapies now where it's very important to understand the specific genetics of a tumor because some tumors are responsive to some drugs and some are not. So if you can understand the tumor's biology, you can give people the treatment they need and you can also avoid giving them treatment they don't need. Now what does this coalition do? Is it doing the science, or is it a lobbying group to get you know, government funds to support research? What, what's the thrust of its effort? The organization does an educational function to help people understand the benefits of personalized medicine. It advances our issues at the major regulatory agencies in Washington, and it releases reports periodically. In fact, the case for personalized medicine, its annual report, is coming out in a couple of weeks. Now, where does it look like medicine is going with all of this new knowledge of genetics? Does it look like we're going in the direction that everybody is going to live longer and healthier and happier lives, or is that too optimistic? No, I think that's likely, and I think that's the objective. If we can help people understand their very specific needs based on the combination of their genetics and the environment they live in, we can intervene earlier and we can intervene more safely to make sure that people are getting the right information, getting the right therapy at the right time. Is this also about empowering patients so that they take more responsibility for their own health? A couple of generations ago, doctors were considered to be sort of godlike figures that you never questioned when they told you something. It was like a pronouncement from Mount Olympus. Yeah, I think. We believe that long, the, in the way we practice medicine, the physician has to be at the center of it. And so what the purpose of all this information is, is to help the patient become more informed so they can, with their physician, make the right decisions for them. Now, is this a pretty smooth path 
uh, or is there any resistance? That there are people who don't want to change. Maybe the system is working well for them the way it is now. I think there is some resistance. The one-size-fits-all mentality that we all grew up with has a lot of inertia, I think. And there is some resistance at the regulatory agencies. The FDA has been struggling for a very long time with how to think about personalized medicine, how to get drugs approved based on specific conditions of individuals. And the insurance companies have been slow to adopt this, although more recently because it has the potential of both improving health outcomes and saving money, the insurance industry is now much more enthusiastic than it has been. Now in the future, can we expect that your doctor will have a copy of your complete genetic profile, and so every time he prescribes anything, it's with your specific genome taken into consideration? Yeah, the advances in the cost of uh, genetic analysis and the sequencing of the human genome, what cost $300 million 15 years ago, now can be done for a few thousand dollars. So it's clear that in the future we'll all be able to have our whole genome sequence available to our physicians. And the interpretation of that is where the information technology comes in, because we're talking about three billion bits of information. And it's not very simple. The notion of a single gene causing disease is rather limited. Most diseases are caused by multiple genes acting together, and the interpretation of that information is very complex. Have we done pretty well as far as understanding the different parts of the genome so that we really have a good handle on what parts cause problems? We only have about half a minute left, so unfortunately this is going to have to be the last yeah. question. I think the answer is we're at the beginning and we've had some great successes, but it's very early. This system is very complicated and we're learning every day more and more and more how to think about genes and how they interact with each other and how they interact with environment. So it looks like genetics is really the future of medicine. That's where most medical development will be in coming years? Absolutely. Okay, very good. It was good to have you here today. We are going to have to wrap the show because we are out of time. I'd like to thank my guest, Bruce Cohen, uh, also my earlier guest, John D'Souza. Thank you for watching. Be sure to visit our website, www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman, and we'll see you next time.